Major support for Do the Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. Good afternoon and welcome to Do The Math. I'm Michael. And I'm Scott. And we'd love to have you be part of our show today. Give us a call. If you're here in Bakersfield, the number is 636-4357. You can phone in your math problem for us to help you out with. If you're in San Luis Obispo, you can also reach us. The number is toll free, 866-636-6284. You can even email us your math question. Do the math at kern.org. You can watch the show online, do the math online.net, and of course, social media. We are all over that thing. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. All right. Well, we do have phone tutors available until 530, as we do most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Also, if you phone in and we do one of your math problems and you phone in from San Luis Obispo County and we do that problem, you'll automatically receive yourself free ice cream from Doc Bernstein's Ice Cream Lab. We have a very special guest in studio. We will put that young man to work in a little bit. That's right. And uh, we will be going out to the Bakersfield Flying Club and learning about all of the different mathematics behind flying and aviation, planes and things like that. But before we do any of that, let's first take a look at today's Math in the News. All right, so I didn't happen to see you yesterday, but did you have a nice holiday, day off Definitely. from Martin Luther King Day? Always good to have an extra day off. There you go. We had a, uh, a great show. We had a uh, young man in here, fifth grader also, who I believe we have today. Mm -hmm. So we may stay with the uh, fraction thing today right. and uh, get some more use out of that. Good thing. Now, it just so happens that today's math in the news coincides with where we're going today with the Bakersfield Flying Club. Right. Do you have any idea when the U.S. Post Office introduced air mail service? Oh, good question. Wow. Now, I'll give you a little bit of a clue, a hint. Okay. It's around because there's this uh, postmark. Yeah. On the... So in the 20s, it looks like? There you go. So All 1920. Right. All right. All right. Uh, could only be flown during daylight hours. So what the pilots would do is they would navigate by following roads, rivers, railroad tracks, and prominent landmarks. Okay. So you would have to know what the prominent landmarks were if you were you got a little right. off track or something like right. that. Right. Uh, 1923, Congress appropriated additional funds to create a lighted airway across the entire United States. Wow. I wasn't aware of this. All right. From San Francisco through Nevada, Utah, Wyoming, Nebraska, Iowa, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. And you can see that on the map right there. Uh, planners devised a system of beacons and emergency runways spaced 10 to 30 miles apart, depending on the train. A 50-foot tall tower was erected with a rotating spotlight installed at the top. Now, that was in 1923. The beacons were close enough so that when a pilot passed over one of them, the next one would be visible in the distance. That worked in clear weather, but on days where it was overcast, visibility was poor, they'd have to do something else to look for the next beacon. That's what I was thinking. You know, if they did that in Bakersfield these days, yeah, you read, yeah, be hard, be kind of hard to see. Fog. So for the foundation for the beacon towers, they poured the foundation in a shape of a 70-foot arrow, okay, <laughs> wow. a 70-foot concrete arrow. Yeah. And what they would do is they would paint them bright yellow also to make them more visible from the sky. Now, so we can see the route here going across country from San Francisco to New York. And the arrows, we can see here's a, just a, a postage stamp commemorating mm -hmm. airmail in the United States. Here, one of those arrows, and you can see here's one that still has some of the so yellow paint on the yellow, it. Right. And you can see if you're looking from above, kind of what it would look like. So, have you? I, I've never seen one of these. Never seen one. Didn't uh, even know they existed. I mean, in, 
it's, they're probably in very remote spots now because they would have been uh, destroyed, paved over, or something like right. that, if in a, another spot. 284 of those beacons wow. were uh, put in place. And they had to run electricity to every one of them to get the lights going, right? Right, they had, yeah, oh, those 50-foot wow. steel towers going. Hmm. Uh, the system was dismantled in the 1940s. They used all of the scrap metal for tanks for the war uh, effort. Okay. All right. Many of the arrows were destroyed to prevent enemies from using them as navigation aids. But there are still many survived to this day. But I thought that was pretty interesting, the, uh, the arrows, you know, kind of looking at it. And if you've ever been in planes like that, those Cessnas and things like that, those mm -hmm. small planes, you've got to look out a long Ahead way first you. to right. see where that is because it's not like you can just you right. know, poke your head over. I mean, you can, but you <laughs> there know, goes your hat. You didn't even know what's going on <laughs> up front. Anyway, so I thought that was pretty interesting. I was like, all right, you need direction when you're looking at a map. You need to know your directions. Right. So one of the things on a map are scales, and a scale drawing is an enlarged or reduced drawing of an object that is similar to an actual object. Maps and floor plans are smaller than the actual size. The scale drawing of a human cell is larger than the actual size. The scale is the ratio that compares the length in a drawing to the corresponding length in the actual object. If a 30-mile road is one inch long on a map, you can write the scale of the map in three different ways. And you can see the three different ways written below. So you've got one inch is to 30 miles, three different ways. Okay. And that's how you represent scale. So I figured, all right, well, let's just go ahead and put one problem up there. So we can say the scale one centimeter is to five kilometers, so the scale factor is five from one to five. Right. The actual distance is 14 kilometers, so that you can figure out on the map, it would come out to be 2.8 centimeters, centimeters if you were going to put that on a map. And that is today's Math in the News. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5.30, most Tuesdays and Wednesdays. In studio with us right now, we have Wyatt. How are you? I'm good. Why don't you let everybody know where you go to school and what grade you're in? I go to Thornhill Elementary and I'm in fifth grade. How's fifth grade? Uh, fifth grade is different than all the other grades. It has its own little section. <laughs> what do you, okay, because a lot of kids are always willing to tell me what they like about what's going on and things like that. What's different, let's say, not that you don't have to not like it, but what's different about fifth grade that you might want to change if you could? Uh, Fifth grade is rough. I mean, like, a lot of kids don't like the P.E. and stuff. I really enjoy the P.E., but... Well, they, um, I'm trying to think of who wouldn't <laughs> like the P.E., but... Um, so is that something that you would alter? You know, you change that, modify that a little bit? Um, not P the P.E., but I would edit, like, the way the staff treat us, because since we're, since we're older, they almost treat us like we're older than we are, mm. but they... They don't treat us like we're kindergartners either. <laughs> All right. So. so the relationships between the students and the staff, that's what yeah, you would help right. work on? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you know what? We're glad you were able to come in today. Are you ready to do a little bit of work? I am. All right. Why don't you head on over to the board? And one of the homework papers you brought in actually has to do with fractions. Right. All right. So here it says estimate, then add. So let's go ahead. We'll just do number one right now since we, we'll start with that one. Two and one-tenth. I don't write that down. So two and one tenth plus five and seven tenths. Oops. There you go. Now the first thing it says, Wyatt, is to estimate it. So how do you estimate a mixed number? Um, hmm. First you would estimate the, um, or you would estimate the fraction and seven would go up to 10, um, then or it is closer to 10 than it is to zero. So that would be, that would go up to the next one, which would make five, six. Oh, I see. Okay, so you took five and seven tenths and made that into six as an estimate. Mm -hmm. Good idea. What about two and one tenth? What would you do there? Uh, one is closer to zero. So um, this would equal back to two because one tenth is closer to zero than it is to um, two the next 10. Right, okay, so as a good estimate for this problem, remember we have a plus sign here, what's a good estimate that the answer might be close to? It might be close to 8. Okay, so we know that that's close to what it is. Shall we do the real thing, Mike? Yeah, let's go ahead and do the, the okay, problem so let's, now. Okay, let's do the real thing and see if we're close to 8, okay? Okay, okay so first, what, I, what my teacher taught me was to stack them up, 
Okay. Good deal. You can see here. I give you a little more room there. That's a good idea to stack them up. Now, why would you stack them up? What's the what's the point there? So that you can see them vertically, and you can add them together. So once you see that these two are lined up, you can eliminate the ten. So now these are both a denominator of ten. Mm -hmm. So you can put that down here. And that is that's kind of important to make sure that the denominators are the same already. Mm -hmm. Okay. So not a lot uh, of extra that, work to that do. That means here. that they are like denominators. Okay. And one plus seven equals eight. Good. What and, about the whole numbers? And the whole numbers are two and five, which makes seven. Good. What would you do next? Uh, seven eighths is um, is close to eight. Thus, mm -hmm. that means that this number is correct because it is close to the estimated answer. It's pretty close. That's exactly right. Now, is there anything else you would do to this answer before you turned it in? Yes. What would you do? I would simplify it. Ah, this good idea. divided by 2, mm -hmm. since 10 and 8 can be divided by 2. Okay. This is the denominator down here. Oh, I see what you're doing, making both of them smaller. Good. Yeah. Okay, so whatever you do to do the numerator, you have to do the denominator. Right. So. The 10 divided by 2 equals 5, mm -hmm. and 8 divided by 2 equals 4. Good. And that, and then you move the whole number over here. Yeah, once you write the whole number or the whole answer all together, so that we can see it all together. 7 and 4 fifths. Is that still pretty darn close to 8? Is that okay mm -hmm. with you? How yep. far away, here's the question of the day, how far away is it from 8? Uh, one fifth. It's only one fifth away, so that's awfully close. And if we ended up with something like 17 and four fifths, then you know that we did something wrong along the way because the estimate helps us know that it's pretty darn close. Mm -hmm. Nice job, good work. There you go, nicely done. Yay! Excellent use of the vocabulary in that as well. Yeah, you do. 636 4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 5 30. Right now, time to go out and about with Mickey. Thanks, Mike. We are here at the Bakersfield Flying Club live with Fred Webster to plan a flight. Fred, how are you doing today? Doing well, Mickey. Glad to see you today. Good to be here. Now, we're at the Bakersfield Flying Club. Can you tell me what exactly the Bakersfield Flying Club is all about? Yes, we started a flying club about six years ago at the airport on Union Avenue. We kind of outgrew that facility, and now we moved to our new facility here in Atlantic Aviation. And we teach people how to fly. We have airplanes that are available to rent out. So right now we have three airplanes and also a full motion Redbird flight simulator. Wow, sounds like you guys made a big step up from the smaller airport hangar, is that right? We absolutely did, yeah. It's been a great club. We have over 100 members right now. Wow, that's awesome. And they all um, rent those three planes and kind of get along together and make shared flights? Yes, and then we even have some members that own their own airplanes, so they're able to come out and you know just join in some of the uh, activities that we have at the flying club. So we do fly out, so we've flown out to Catalina Island and. Uh, fly to different museums along the in the valley. Wow, sounds like a sounds like a pretty good setup here at the Bakersfield Flying Club. Now, I heard a rumor that we may be making a flight today. Is that correct? That is that is correct. We're going to fl uh, plan out a trip to Las Vegas, Nevada to catch a, a game. Awesome. Now, I'm sure a lot of people at home may think you just hop in the plane, punch in a couple things in the GPS and we're off to the races here. But Tell me, is it a little more complex than that? It is a lot more complicated than that. So you know, ah. right, what we need to do is figure out a route, how we're going to get there. And then we also have to figure out if the airplane can carry the weight uh, with the baggage, the passengers. And then we also have to figure out our weight and balance and so forth and how much fuel we need to carry on that trip. Wow, so it sounds like we have a lot of math coming into play here. But first you said we have to plan a route, is that right? That is correct. So I think we're looking at the sectional chart here and it looks like this orange highlighter here, it looks like we've kind of planned a route starting here. And this is the airport we're at, over here at Meadows? Yep, that's Bakersfield. Meadows Airport. Okay, so it looks like we're going to start here, and it looks like we're going to follow this orange highlighter route out across the desert and then finally up to Las Vegas. But Fred, my question to you is, why are we making these different turns here? Couldn't we just make a straight route to Las Vegas at this it time? It would be great to go straight, but unfortunately we have a couple of things. You can see those brown, those are mountains, so we need to go around the mountains. But the biggest problem we have is all this blue area, if you see it says restricted, that's where the military does a lot of their uh, training exercises. So there's high-speed jet aircraft flying through there, and we're not allowed to fly through there. So we're going to go around 
uh, the airspace. Gotcha. So it looks like based on our different route stops here and, you know, different points that we're going to go to, why did you choose these points and then how do we use them in um, planning out our flight today? Well, the airplane has radios that we could use for navigation. So by the time we get going, it might be starting to get dark. So it would be really hard to follow roads. So we use these VORs to navigate or we could even use a GPS in the airplane. And this is really a route that would be real common to use to stay away from all the restricted airspace. Okay, so it looks here on document one it says, this shows our flight plan from Bakersfield to Vegas. Now, we're looking here, it says PMD, DAG. Can you kind of tell us what all these different uh, points and numbers kind of represent here? Yeah, so the PMD is the first a uh, point we're going to fly to is Palmdale VOR and then Daggett and then I picked a point about 25 miles from Henderson Airport that we're going to start descending to get set up for our landing in Henderson. Uh, and all of the rest of the things we have to figure out is how the wind is going to affect us because even though the airplane is pointing say directly east the wind could be blowing us from the north causing us to track a little bit to the southeast so we won't stay on course. Okay. So we get a weather briefing and we're able to use some of these tools, a plotter, uh, and an E6B flight computer in order to figure out what wind correction we would need in order to stay on our course. Okay, so now talking on the math side of it, the numbers side, how many actual data points go into making a flight? Are we talking about just speed? Um, does fuel come into consideration to weight? I mean, what really affects a plane's performance? And I, I guess my question is, how much can we bring on our flight today? Can we load seven people on the plane, or what are we really limited by in that well, sense? That's a very good question, and we do have a lot of math involved. So we're going to look at document number two, which is actually shows the weight of the airplane. So anytime a, a radio is installed uh, in the airplane or taken out or even upholstery changed, the airplane's reweight so we can make sure that we know how much the weight is, and also we want to know the center of gravity, which is really determined by the moment. What the center of gravity is, when we look at an airplane, is it's balance either uh, uh, nose heavy or mm -hmm. tail heavy. So if it's too far no nose heavy, it could be hard to land, and also um, we will burn more fuel. If the airplane's too far tail heavy, if the airplane stalls, which we don't want to stall the airplane, yeah, I don't the think wing stops like producing lift, idea. it's very difficult to recover from that. So, okay. And all the manufacturers have a... Um, a graph that we have to stay with inside the graph. And document number four kind of explains the arm from where the zero center of gravity is, and we're going to keep moving it back as we put passenger weight in, uh, and then as we f move further back, it's going to affect the CG aft even further. CG being center of gravity, correct? Correct. Okay. Center of gravity, yes. And then, so we have the passengers in the rear, and then we also have the baggage compartment in the back. Okay. okay? So then we're going to take a look at document number three, which I took all of our weights. We have the aircraft weight that we got off the document after our radio was installed. And so that, that aircraft weight is this with the airplane, with the aircraft with no passengers, no weight, no fuel? No fuel. It just includes the engine oil uh, and the weight of the aircraft. Okay. And then we'll take the fuel, 156 pounds of fuel, which is 26 gallons. The airplane holds 40 gallons of fuel. But if we put in 40 gallons, it's going to weigh 240 pounds more, which would put us over our max takeoff weight. Which, at that point, we just can't get off the ground. Is that right? Well, we could take off, but it could be dangerous, so we don't want to do uh, that. So. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the, I like, I like the air of caution there. We'll roll with that. So it would be nice to go with fuel tanks, but we have three people that want to go in a lot of bags. So we either have to leave someone behind, or we'll just leave some uh, less fuel. Okay, sounds good. So we're looking down here, we have pilot and front passenger, and then rear passenger and so forth. So then we have 200 pounds for the rear passenger and all this camera gear, and then 100 pounds of bags, and it comes up to a total of 2,294 pounds, 0.6 pounds, which is just under our 2,300 pound weight, which so we're good there. So we're right at the envelope of what the air, what the manufacturer is recommending we take on board. Is which that is right? no problem at all, yes. All right. The next thing we look at, we add all those moments, which are measured from the front of the back of the aircraft off this previous graph I showed okay. you. And we'll add all those up, and that comes up to 103.8. Uh, another thing just about fuel, what I like to talk about fuel is with the 26 gallons of fuel, it's about three hours of fuel, 
And when we looked at our flight plan, we had figured it, it was two hours and 13 minutes to get over to Las Vegas. Okay. So we don't want to land in Las Vegas with no fuel at all. So the FAA actually requires you have 30 minutes of fuel, which is about four gallons, and no one would want to land with just four gallons <laughs> of fuel. Because what if you couldn't find the airport? Now you'd have not much fuel left at all. Okay. If it's at nighttime, you're required to have 45 minutes of fuel. So uh, we'll probably be getting there at night, so we want to have at least six gallons when we land, but we're probably going to have about 15 gallons. Okay. okay, so these are all just cautionary numbers that we want to make sure are within our margins of safety. Is that Absolutely. right? Absolutely, yeah. We want to be safe because we can't just pull over to the side of the road like you can in a car. So. And wait for a tow truck to bring us some gas. Once yes. we're out of gas, we're kind of like a... Like a paper airplane, is that right? Yeah, it's like a paper airplane, a big lighter. I like that idea. It makes me a little happier inside. So now we're looking at this document. It talks about center of gravity limits. Can you kind of explain to us, do those other numbers we just calculated in terms of weight and moment apply in this graph? They sure do. So this is the, the graph that the aircraft manufacturer came up with. They test the airplane to make sure that it'll be safe. So first they come up with it. The weight column is on the left-hand side, and the center of gravity is on the, the bottom. So we knew we came up with a weight of 2294.6, so we could just go right up to the top 2300 we come across, and we came up with a moment <coughs> of 103.8. So what we need to do is that moment has actually been divided by 1,000, so we're working with smaller numbers. So we took that 1,000, or at, times it by 1,000, so now it came up to 103. 800, 103,800, and we're going to divide it by the weight, and that'll give us our center of gravity inches, 45.24. Okay. So it puts us inside the envelope. So we took the 45, we're up here, and that's where our final center of gravity of the airplane is. So we're well within the safety envelope of the aircraft. So the manufacturer is telling us because of our weight, where it's distributed, we are safe for our flight. It looks like we're green to go. That's it. We're green to go. All right. Sounds good. And now back to you, Mike, in the studio. All right, thanks for that, Mickey and Fred. We'll check in back with the Flying Club a little bit later on. 636-4357 is the phone number. We do have phone tutors available until 530. We've got Wyatt in studio, a fifth grade student from Thorner Elementary. And you know what? Before we get going, what is the mascot for Thorner? The Thorner? Thunderbolts. Thunderbirds. All right, you know Thunderbol what? I think I knew that at one point, but... Thunderbolts. Oh, Thunderbolts. Yeah. Oh, all right, Thunderbirds, I thought. You know, I was thinking like... <laughs> all right. Old man, old cars, right? There you go. Birds, right? T -birds. That's right. All right. Wyatt, let's get you back going again. We're going to add okay. some more fractions, but this time we're going to do it with unlike denominators. All right. So here's the problem we have. 11 and 3 fifths plus 6 and 4 fifteenths. And if you would be so kind as to estimate and then actually do the problem. Okay, so okay. we're going to estimate this one. What is this one going to round to or estimate as? 4 goes to 0 rather than 15, so that would just equal 6. Okay, and this one, if we had to estimate this one? 11 and 3 fifths? 3 is closer to the 5 than 0, so it okay. would be 12. All right, so the estimate for this problem is going to be? 18. Okay, so go ahead and write that over there on the side, so we know that hopefully our answer is close to 18. Okay, so now... I know you like to line them up. You ready to do that? Okay. Oops. Let's just. Good. There we go. So you're writing the whole thing again, and you're lining up those fractions and the whole numbers, right? Right. 11 and 3 fifths and 6 and 4 fifteenths. Okay, now this one's going to be a little bit different, so tell me what you're thinking about how to start this problem because the last one, the denominators were the same, right? Right. And now they're different, so what are you going to do? Okay, so 15, um, let's do it over here, 15 and 5, mm -hmm. we're going to find the, um, we're going to find the least common denominator. Okay, good idea. Of it, so we're going to go 5. 10, 15, and once you get to 15, you know the first one is 15. Oh, I see. So the same, they're the same. So, so you're comparing we're... multiples of the two numbers. Right. Okay. And since, so just to make it easy, 15 times 1 equals 
15. Right. right. And isn't it nice when the least common denominator is one of the numbers already, right? You don't right. have to change that bottom number. That's good. Okay. And then just to make sure times 1 equals 4. Mm -hmm. so, so that one didn't just, change. No, that but didn't change. But the top change. one's going to change. Right. So 5 times 3 equals 15. Okay. And whatever you do to the denominator, you have to do to the numerator. So 3 times 3 equals 9. Good. Uh, nine plus four, nine plus four equals thirteen. You're all ready to add then, huh? Yeah. And what's the denominator for the answer? It would be fifteen. Okay, same thing. Gotcha. Nine plus four equals thirteen. Okay. Okay. Now we're gonna add the whole numbers. Okay. Eleven plus six equals seventeen. And what it's was that estimate? Eighteen. Is that close? Yep. How close is it? Two fifteenths. Two fifteenths away. So you're doing some subtraction in your head. If you added two fifteenths to this, would you get right to 18? Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Man, well done. I'm really impressed. Good job. Nicely done once again. So we can give a little curve there with the unlike denominators, yeah. but handled it well right there. And you know what? For working so beautifully on those fraction problems, we have got a free meal courtesy of our friends at Chick-fil-A. So congratulations on that. Hope you get an opportunity to head on over there and say hi to Troy and the boys over at Chick-fil-A. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. We'll put Wyatt back to work. We'll visit with Mickey. We'll do it all right after this. Today we're at that Giorgio School, where home of the dragons are. And today we're here to... Well, this afternoon, we're working with sixth grade student, Jesus. Everything going well? Yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and get to work. We have a problem here where we are 32 feet from ourselves to the door. And we'd okay. like to know how many yards that is. So first, what we're going to do is we're going to just review some basics about some measurement. All right. So if we have 12 inches, that's equal to one foot. Yeah. Right? If we have one ruler, we have one foot, which is 12 inches. If we take the one foot and we multiply it by three, we have three feet, and that's the same as one yard. Okay? So we can see if we had one foot, it's the same as 12 inches. And if we had three of these, it would be 36 inches. It would also be one yard, and it would also be three feet. Yeah, three feet. Right? So we need to know how many yards it is from here to the door if it's 32 feet. So we're going to go 32 feet, and we're going to do something with it. What are we going to do with it? We're going to divide it by 3. There we go. All right, so go ahead and work on that. 32 divided by 3. There we go. Now it's coming out dark. So, of course, you know, 3 goes into 3 one time. Okay. Then we bring down the 2. Good. And of course, you know, three is bigger than two, so we can't go into it. Okay. So, so we'll put a zero yeah, up top, right, to for that placeholder. Good. And so it, it, it'll be remainder two. Right, right, so it's going to be 10 yards remainder two. But we can't say if we're talking like, all right, well, it's 10 yards and remainder two. So it's going to be 10 yards and some part of a yard. Yeah. So a part of a yard is going to be a fractional part. Right, it's not going to be a whole yard, okay? So if we're going with remainder two, so let's say we have this left and we have this left. So we have two out of how many? Three. We have two out of three, right? So it's going to be ten and how many yards? Ten, ten and how many yards? Mm, two. Right, two out of what? Three. Three. How do we write two out of three? If I said you have a four out of five chance of flipping a coin to get heads or whatever, okay? So that's four out of five. How are we going to write two out of three? Two out of three, so like, so like this. We'll have to write it like that, right? Perfect. See, and because here we have our remainder two out of three. Yeah. So instead of leaving it as 10 R2, 10 remainder two, how do we write our final answer? Write it. Because we still have our whole number 10 yards, right? So 10. So 10 will be the whole. The remainder will, so three 
will go in the bottom right. Right. And then the remainder is two, so it's ten, two thirds. Right. So how many yards is it from here to the door if it's thirty-two feet? How many yards? Uh, it's is it? ten. T ten to two half yards, or almost or no, ten. And say that again. Um, t two. Two thirds. Perfect. Two, two there thirds. you go. Ten and two thirds. Hey Zeus. Oh, nice work. And just a reminder, we do have phone tutors available until 5.30 on most Tuesdays and Wednesdays throughout the regular school year. Wyatt has been adding fractions, and now we're going to move to the next step. We're going to subtract some. So, Wyatt, I will let you choose the first mixed number. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let's do 5 and 2 elevenths. Wow. Ooh, nice. All right. Subtract. Three and four thirty thirds. <laughs> there you go. Hot shot. Work on that one. What do you think, okay. Wyatt? Should we estimate first just to make sure we know what mm -hmm. we're heading for? Yeah. Okay, let's estimate. Four is obvious now. So I always like to write two. this little arrow here. What's this one going to round to? Uh, zero. Or this is going to go to zero and yep. this is just going to be a normal three. Okay, what about the five and two elevenths? That will go also down okay. to. Five. Okay, so what's a good estimate for this answer here? Eight. Uh-oh, hold on. Don't forget, what kind of sign are we doing here? Oh, minus. Right? Ah, yeah. Okay. You, got some, you got addition on the brain there. That's okay. Okay, so we want to do, basically, right, our estimate is five minus three. Equals two. Gotcha. So we're shooting at the end for a two here. You want to stack them? Uh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. So three, four, thirty. And Mike wasn't nice enough to give you the same denominator, but that's okay. I'm sure you can handle this. What is the least common denominator between 11 and 33? Are you supposed to multiply 11 times 33? No. Mm, that'd be a pretty big number. It would work, but we probably don't want to do that. What are you going to do? We're going to list out the least common denominator of 11 and 33. Okay. 11, 22, 33. Three. Uh, so that's it. So these are the multiples of 11. Right. Good. And 33 is just 33. 33. Good. Oops. So, and we have a similar situation that we had last time, which is one of the denominators already is 33. So you won't okay. have to change that one, which is nice. So 433 is going to stay the same. Right. And what about the 211? So you got some room to put that up there somewhere? Uh, you can use yeah. the minus sign if you want. Maybe just make that new fraction right there. Okay. So this, so 11 times 3 equals 33. Mm -hmm. And 2 times 3, because whatever you do to the denominator, you have to do the new, right? Good. Uh, 2 times 3 equals 6. Good. So we we're multiplying times 3 here, right? Just to see what's going right. on there. And we'll get that out of the way. And don't forget, this is a subtraction problem. Right. Are you ready to subtract now? Yep. Okay. 6 minus 4 equals 2, so it's 2, and the denominator is 33, Okay. 30 thirds. And then we do the whole numbers, 5 minus 3 equals 2, and 2, 2, and 2, 30 thirds rounds back to 2. There's the estimate, estimated. that's right. Now, at the end of the last problem, we had to do some reducing. What about this one? Do you have to reduce this one? This one we don't have to reduce because the only fa common factors of two and thirty or two and thirty-three is one, and that means it's completely simplified. What are, what is the what's the other number that goes into two besides one? Two. So one and two. What about thirty-three? What numbers go into thirty-three? You said one. One. What else? Yeah. Three. Three. Eleven. Eleven. And thirty-three. And so there's none of them in common, so we right. can't cancel anything out. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you nailed that one. What would happen? How far away are we from the estimate? This should be a pretty straightforward question, right? The estimate was two. Mm -hmm. We're at two and two thirty thirds. Um, two how much? How much? Uh, two thirty third. That's how much we're over. Can you see in this problem when you picked five and two elevenths? 
Can you see why Mike picked three and four thirty thirds? Yes, because 11 times 3 equals 33. That's right. So he knew that at some point you're going to get the nice common denominator, right? And here's the last question for you. What would happen? We don't have to do it, but what would happen if the bottom number here, right? This is 6 33rds. This is 4 33rds. What if the bottom number was like 14 33rds and you didn't have enough to subtract? What would you do? You would borrow over here. Ah, and just like a regular subtraction four, problem. Mm -hmm. And then you add 33 since that's the denominator. 33 plus 6 equals 39, wow. and minus 14. I guess we can't stump you with that one either. Yeah, really I was well done. Say, I thought we'd get him going right now <laughs> to the next problem, but we've already done that one now. <laughs> Nicely done, Wyatt. Hey, Nicely we do have phone tutors available until 5.30. Right now, we're going to go out and about, see how they're doing with the flight plan at the Bakersfield Flying Club with Mickey and Fred. Thanks, Mike. We are here at the Bakersfield Flying Club live with Fred Webster here at the plane to continue our flight plan. Now, Fred, we did all that paperwork inside. We went over the numbers. We crunched it all. It looks like we're underweight. Can we just hop in and start the engine up and take off? That sounds like a great plan, but we're not going to do that. So oh. Before we get flying, we're going to actually do a pre-flight. We actually have a checklist that we use to, to pre-flight the airplane. Okay. And then once we get the airplane pre-flighted, one of the big things we have to worry about on this aircraft is make sure that we don't have too much fuel because we figured out we needed, I think, 26 gallons of fuel. So we're going to check the fuel. And the way we check the fuel, which just kind of looks like a straw and it has numbers on it, and we'll drop it down in the fuel tank, put our finger over it and pull it out and make sure that we have the right amount of fuel to make sure that we have enough fuel for the journey and also that we're not have too much fuel that we can't take off because we're overweight. Yeah, that's right, Mary, because you're pretty close on that margin there. So you said we're starting in the cockpit, right? Or we just gonna, yeah, so we're gonna walk kinda, around and okay. we'll start I'll meet in the you cockpit. on this side. I'll meet you All over right. there. All right. So when we get in the airplane, we want to unlock the flight controls so that we could check them as we do our pre-flight. And when you follow the checklist along, make sure that everything is completed before you go outside. We check all of our required documents, just like in a car, it has a registration. Okay. And we also have an owner's manual in case we have any problems with the airplane once we take off. Okay. We'll know how to deal with it. There's emergency checklists in here. As regular as regular normal procedure checklists as well. Okay, so it's kind of your all-in-one. If you need anything, this is where it is. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. And, and a lot of the radios are very complicated, and we'll show those once we get done with the pre-flight. So there's also manuals for the radios how to operate them. Perfect. All right. So we've checked inside the cockpit. Everything looks like it's ready to go for now. We talked about checking fuel quantity. Yes. So where's the fuel, I mean, is it below our feet, in front of us? Where's the fuel kept in an airplane most commonly? Inside the wings. Each of the wing has a fuel tank. So. Ah, I didn't know that. Let's check it out. All right. So there's fuel in the wings right now. Is that what I'm hearing? There is fuel in the wings. Okay. So we, we hope so. We need fuel to go to Las Vegas. Yes, so. we do. So we're going to actually drop the tank in. And this is showing right at 15 gallons. So, And I checked the tank on the other side already, and it has 12 gallons. So that gives us 27 gallons. That's right. I think that was right as how much we needed, correct? We needed exactly 26 gallons. So we have one extra gallon. So gotcha. we'll probably have to burn a little bit of that off before we take off. Okay. So we would just kind of let the engine run up for a little bit Maybe to kind I'll of burn even that? Just take a turn around a patch by okay. myself and that'll burn up the fuel. I like it. All right. So we've checked the fuel. We, we, we're saying it's good to go. Now I'm, I'm looking here and this is kind of, you know, usually if something's red, it's kind of like uh, an it's, important item here. What is this here? This is a cover that covers our pitot tube. And the pitot tube is what works our airspeed indicator, which tells us how fast the airplane is flying through the air. Okay. And now I remember on our flight plan, we, um, did we have an airspeed we have to go at? Is there is there an airspeed that'll help us get there the fastest but also be efficient? Yeah, we're actually set a power setting. So we had figured out the power setting is going to be 2,500 RPMs. Okay. And that'll that'll determine how much fuel we burn, and also the performance uh, numbers in our manual tell us how fast we'll fly. So we'll be at 110 knots wow. flying through the air, which is about 130 miles per hour. So. It's We'll get, we'll get there pretty much faster than anyone on the ground. Absolutely. A little over two hours to Las Vegas is a 
good uh, short distance flight. I'll take so. that. So what else do we have to look at on the plane in terms of like a, a pre-flight before we hop in and start the engine? What, what are the important things we have to check oh, on? It's very detailed. Uh, so we want to check and make sure that there's no damage to the leading edge of the wing. Okay. And we check all of our lights. Now the lights, are these the, um, you know, what, I see two different ones here. What's, what's the difference? Yeah, so we have a red light, almost like boats have the same thing. Okay. So we have a red light on the left wing, a green light on the right wing, and a white light on the, on the tail, so that ah. you can tell which direction the airplane's flying if you just saw it flying through the air. These are strobe lights, so it's easier, almost like a flash bulb going off, so it's much easier to see the airplane day or night with those flash, those flashing strobes. Okay, more of just kind of help other people see you in the air and to see other people as well? Yes, yeah. So it's all, it's all relating back to that safety factor, right? Yes, yeah, and especially right. on a day like today where it's pretty foggy, mm -hmm. so we want to be able to have people see us. Okay. This is called an aileron. Okay. And what the aileron does, if you notice, if I move the aileron down, if the, as the air hits the bottom of the wing, it's going to lift this wing up. If we look on the other side, the other aileron is up. So as the air hits, goes across, it's going to push that wing down. Okay, okay. so there, there are always ones being turn. lifted and one being pushed down. Yes, so they work in opposite directions. So if we turn the wheel to the left, our thumbs are facing up. And that's pointing at the up aileron. If we look to the right, we'd see the other aileron down. Okay. The other big flight control surface, if we pull back on the control yoke, it causes the elevator to go up. And right now, you can see the elevator's kind of drooping down. So that is what happens if we push forward on the yoke. It pushes that tail up to kind of put the airplane in a down position? Yes. Okay. And really, what everyone thinks that makes the airplane go up and down, and really what it does is it, it controls how fast the airplane's moving. So. If the nose is pointed up too high, the airplane is going to be slower. It, it also increases the angle of attack on the wing. Now, the angle of attack, is that just how much wind is hitting surfaces? No, it's actually the direction of the airplane with the opposite against the angle of the actual uh, direction of travel of the airplane. Okay. So, so now I'm looking at these antennas up here. I think we have one more item we can talk about. What's this one here in the back? It's kind of sticking off the middle here. Why, what, why is that so the important? The black antenna, it's an ELT antenna, and that stands for Emergency Locator Transmitter. And this aircraft has a GPS uh, controlled one, so what that means is the GPS in the airplane feeds information to the, it's the black box. Everyone's heard of the black boxes, they're actually, oh, okay. they're yeah. bright orange. So if we ever land or crash somewhere, it turns on automatically if you have an impact, so the search rescue folks could come find us. Gotcha. So again, relating all back to that safety here, it looks like even from the pre-flight, even out here at the airplane, it's all about safety and having a safe flight. Absolutely. Yeah. We want to be safe. I love it. Perfect. All right. When we come back, I hear I'll be taking the controls. We'll see how it goes. We'll send it back to you in the studios, Mike. All right. Thanks for that, Mickey. I have every confidence that uh, you behind the controls with Fred. Everything will be smooth. Hey, we do have phone tutors available until 530. Speaking of smooth, everything has been running smoothly with Wyatt and Fractions thus far. Mm -hmm. So let's add a little twist here, son, shall we? All right. Okay. All right. You've added, you've subtracted, now let's multiply. You, once again, come up with a fraction. Okay. Let's do... Three-tenths. Three-tenths right. times... Mm-hmm. Here it comes. All right. Let's go four-fifths. Easy peasy. Really? even though you've never done multiplying before? So here's a couple questions for you. First of all, do you have to do any, anything with these fractions to get the denominators the same? Mm, yes. You do? You gotta change them to the same? Now uh, we had to do that in addition. Right. We had to do that in subtraction. What about multiplication? Uh, no. Yeah. You don't have to worry about that, which is kinda nice. So if you have to do fractions, sometimes I tell my students, hey, you might as well do some multiplication because you, you don't have to change denominators. All right. So what's the process you're gonna go about trying to figure this problem out? You're going to go with these two. Okay. 10 and 5. Yeah. And then you're going to do these two at the top. Gotcha. And then the answer is still going to be in a fraction, right? Right. All right, go get them. So 10 times 5 equals 50. Mm -hmm. uh, 3 times 4 equals 12. And what do you want to do with 12 over 50? Um, they both can be divided by 2. They can, that's right. Let's see what you got there. Um, 12 divided by 2 equals 6, mm -hmm. and 
50 divided by 2 equals 25. Good. And I'm just going to stick that 2 in there like you were saying, just so we know that we're dividing them both by 2. Now, I really like what you did there. There's a really fun way to do this problem. I'm going to go ahead and write the same exact thing that we had before. 3 over 10 times 4 over 5. Okay? And we know that the final answer for this problem is 6 over 25, right? Mm -hmm. But if you multiply straight across, what you got was 12 over 50. Mm -hmm. There is a way to multiply straight across where you will get right to the reduced answer. And it's called cross-canceling. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some numbers that are diagonal of each other. Is there anything at all that you can divide into 3 and into 5? No. Mm, Except what are the, for 1. Right, just 1, right? What are the factors of 3? 1 and 3. 1 and 3. And what about 5? 1 and 5. 1 and 5. All right, let's look at the other diagonal. 4 and 10. Is there anything you can, you can divide into those numbers? 2. 2. So just like you divided 2 at the end, instead of doing it at the end, we can actually do it in the middle of the problem. And that's called cross-canceling. So can you divide 4 divided by 2? Mm-hmm. Okay, so cross off 4 and put a? 2. 2. That's right. Cross off 10. What's 10 divided by 2? 5. 5. Now multiply straight across and see what you get. If you okay. multiply straight across with the numbers that are left over. Okay. 5 times 5 equals 25. Uh-huh. And 3 times 2 equals 6. Hey, Whoa. look at that. Yeah, that's a pretty good deal, huh? So it's totally okay to multiply the numbers straight across and reduce at the end. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But if you want to save yourself a little bit of effort doing some reducing, you can do what's called cross-canceling. Look for those numbers that are diagonal of each other and see if you can make those ones smaller. You've got to yeah. be able to make both of them, but you can do that before you even start. Will it ever be both of them can be? Sometimes both of them can be. Yeah, that's exactly right. So that's why we check this one first. Didn't work. Then we check this one. Sometimes both of them. Sometimes neither one of them. In this case, we only had one of them we could, we could do some cross-canceling on. And then if it's neither one, then you stick to this. Then you just stick to that. That's exactly right. Nicely done, guys, right there. And I like the reaction when you saw that. That, oh, whoa, that yeah. really works. And the reason I wanted you to do that, to see how you could simplify it first, is because when you have larger numbers, you don't necessarily want to always be able to multiply those and get an even larger number. Right. Right. If you can make them smaller, it makes everything a little bit easier. All right? So there are a lot of other things with multiplying fractions, but go ahead, clear the board. We're moving on to the next step. We will now divide. Oh, okay. my goodness. All right, so here we go. 7 ninths, 7 over 9, divided by 5 over 18. And you've got Scott right there to help you out if you're not sure on, like, how to start or mm. what to do first. Any idea how to do division? No, not but I do see that... 9 times 2 equals 18. Yeah, so. that's a really good thing to know. That's exactly right. The problem is they're not diagonal of each other, right? And we're not multiplying. So, can you tell me a little bit about what is the opposite of addition? Subtraction. Subtraction. What's the opposite of multiplication? Division. Division. So, addition and subtraction are kind of similar, right? Multiplication and division are similar. They're kind of in the same group, right? So, here's how it works. Do you know what the word reciprocal means? Mm -mm. How about inverse? Have you heard that word before? Mm -hmm. What's the inverse? It means, like, I hear the term inverse operation a lot. Okay. And that means the opposite. Exactly right. So if you just had 5 over 18, that was all you had. Okay? Don't look at the rest of the problem. Just 5 over 18. What would be the inverse of 5 over 18? What do you think you could do to that to change it up and have it be different than what it is? 18, 15. Or 18 fifths. That's it. That's exactly right. So you can use that word inverse or you can use reciprocal. Okay? So here's how a division problem works. You keep the first fraction the same, right? And then take the reciprocal of the second one. Can you write the reciprocal of the second one there? You told me it was 18 over 5. Now we can't just randomly change a number and expect the operation to stay the same. But you do know how to multiply, right? Right. So when you take the reciprocal of the second fraction, you get to change this one to multiply. So you multiply this? Yep, that's it. And now, what you noticed earlier is really going to help you. Where are you going to okay. go from here? Um, first, we're going to go 7 and 5, and they have nothing in common except for 1, and okay. that makes them prime. Okay. 9 and 18 have 3 in common Okay. and 9 in common. All right. So which one do you think you might want to divide by? 9. Why? So that it gets simplified farther. Ah, that's right. We want to make those numbers as small as possible. So, so we're dividing both by 9. Cross this off. Yep. And put this as a 1. Good. And cross this off and put it as a 2. All right. 
What do you think? What's next? Okay, so seven over one means seven holes. Yeah. So that can be make it be into a whole number. Mm-hmm. Ma be made. We could do that, three. but we still have some fractions to multiply, right? Let's mm -hmm. go ahead and multiply the fractions first, and then at the end, if we need to change it, we can do that. How about that? Okay. Can you go straight across now? Uh, yes. Okay. So one times five equals five. Good. And seven times two equals fourteen. It's an improper fraction. It is an improper fraction. What do you want to do with that one? What thing? What makes it so improper? Bad manners? Uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, because fourteen is um is more than five, meaning there can be more. There can be a hole inside of it. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So what do you want to do to fix that? We don't want to leave it like that, right? Right. Can you reduce that fraction anymore? Uh, no. Can't reduce it. We did the reducing when you did your cross canceling. Well done there. Okay. So how do you want to change this to a number that's not so improper? Um, we're going to put an equal sign okay. and we're going to make it into a mixed number. How do you do that? 5 can go into 14 twice okay. before turning into 10 okay. and then 14 is not quite enough so that would leave 4 fifths. Wow, is there a way you can check to see if 2 and 4 fifths can go back to 14 over 5? How would you check that? Um, f so 5 is the denominator, so how many holes there is, you can add f five, so you go times, times, wait, what was I thinking? Um, no, plus yeah. five plus five. Oh, for each of the twos. Right. I like that. And five plus five equals 10, so you can p just put the one right there. Oh, nice. And there's your 14 fifths. So final answer, two and four fifths, huh? Really well done. I like what you did there. Learned a little bit about reduce or doing some division, right? What is this number called when you flip it over? Inverse. An inverse or what's or the other word? It's a good one. Reciprocal. Reciprocal. That's right. Good job. All right. Nicely done right there. Why, why don't you come on over here for a moment? So we've had you do quite a bit of work on fractions. So you were adding some with unlike denominators, then like denominators, subtracted some, multiplied some for the first time, and then divided some for the first time. Out of all of those things, and you learned a couple of new things today, what do you think was the, the best thing you learned or something that you think was, wow, I really like that and something you're going to be able to um, take from here? I liked that um, you, could, you could flip things or flip the two numbers around and that you could do diagonally. There you go. So using the reciprocal, right, when you're doing a division problem and then being able to simplify before actually going in and multiplying, right? Mm -hmm. Those are going to be very, very important steps as you're in fifth grade now. Those are going to be important steps for the rest of fifth grade. And guess when else? Sixth grade. And when else? Seventh grade. And when else? <laughs> Eighth grade. That's right. All those different <laughs> grades right there. Hey, let's, uh, we, we uh, do have phone tutors available until 530 this afternoon. We're going to go out one more time to the Bakersfield Flying Club, meet with Fred and Mickey. Thanks, Mike. We're here for our last segment today at the Bakersfield Flying Club with Fred Webster. We've checked out the plane. I've hopped in the simulator here at the club. You know, it looks like it's time to go for a flight, right, Fred? Absolutely. So All right. We need to set up our navigation radius for the first leg of our flight. Okay. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is fly the Palmdale VOR. So okay. So let's go ahead and put the frequency in. It's uh, 114.5. Okay. So we just kind of adjust it with the knobs. and. Yep. Now, Oops. the VOR, are, are we flying towards that frequency? Yes. So let us know where we're at in, in relation to this uh navigation facility that's out in the middle of the desert in Palmdale. Okay. So we're looking at our course that we had calculated on earlier, it's 122. So we could go ahead and adjust this navigation radio to 122. Oh, of course it was all the way around on the other side almost. So that's there we go. all right. All right, so there we go. So that's set to 122. And we're gonna make sure that we have it set on the VOR. There we go. And we're ready for takeoff. So All once right. we get airborne, we'll make a right turn and start heading towards Las Vegas. Sounds like a plan. So go ahead and talk me through it. What do I have to do next? All right, so we're lined up on the runway. Okay. So we'll go ahead and bring the throttle all the way in. Okay. And once we get to about 55 miles an hour or knots, and that's what the pitot tube that we looked at on the airplane. Okay. That's what that's reading is the airspeed of the airplane. So at around 55 knots, we'll give it a little bit of back pressure. Okay. And a little back pressure here. Perfect, and we'll put the nose just about on the horizon line. Excellent. And that'll give us the proper 
Remember the pitch is controlling our airspeed, remember? Okay, That's yeah, with, with, the yeah with the yoke. Okay. So we'll hold it at that pitch angle and about 80 knots is a good airspeed to climb out at. Now kind of talk me through these um, these different instruments here. What are they showing us? So on the very far left, we'll talk about these are called the six pack instruments. Oh, so every pilot has a six pack, right? That's it. They go uh, to the gym it. and work out. So we have the uh, airspeed indicator and then we have the attitude indicator which shows your airplane's relation to the horizon. Okay. Either pitched up or down or banking left or right. All right. Then we have the altimeter which reads how far the airplane is above sea level. Okay. Baker shows around 500 feet above sea level uh -huh. so when we took off we were already at 500 feet and it has three hands in it. That's 10,000, 1,000, 100. So right now we're less than 2,000 so we're at 1,700 feet and climbing. The next instrument we have is a backup to let us know if the wings are level or not. It's called the turn coordinator. And then we have the directional gyro, which is kind of like a compass. And then we have the vertical speed indicator. It shows how many feet per minute the airplane's climbing or descending. Okay. So what we're trying to do is turn around to the about a 120 degrees and that'll put us on our first leg towards Palmdale. Okay, so it kind of gets us, tells us this is the general direction you need to take for now? Yes. Okay. And then we'll have that little sectional chart out that we had earlier to kind of follow along to make sure we're on course. I like it. So it's not all just hop in the plane, punch a couple things, and you're off to the races. It seems like there's a little more procedure to it than that. That is correct. And a lot of math involved because we would write down what time we took off from because we want to make sure that we're following our flight plan because let's say the first leg is supposed to take us 39 minutes okay well if it takes us one hour so we're running late that's not a big problem but the big problem is we won't have enough fuel right yeah we got yeah we got to make sure we have just enough fuel yeah, to get so there we want to make sure that we run on time because the longer the engine runs the more fuel we burn okay, okay. so it looks like we're coming up on 122 here so I just want to kind of roll level and yep. stay on that heading Perfect. And we can almost even visually look out. We kind of want to fly right through that little pass right there. Okay. So now when we talked about that fuel consumption. You said we had to fly at about 2,500 RPMs. Is that right? We we're going to climb at full power. But okay. once we level off, and we're going to climb to 5,500 feet. That's what we planned our flight at. Okay. And then we'll set the 2,500 RPMs to get the right true airspeed. Okay. Very nice. So it looks like... There's more planning than people think when it comes to flying planes. There's a lot more math involved, a lot more uh, using numbers in different ways. Is that right? That is that is correct. So we do uh, use a lot of math to be a pilot. Perfect. So I'm going to kind of hold one hand on the wheel here. And, and from all of us here at Do The Math, we want to say thank you for letting us come out today and kind of learn what it takes to be a pilot and what it goes uh, into making a, a flight, even if it's just to a University of Las Vegas. It seems like there's a lot more steps than a lot of people think of. So we want to say thank you for uh, having us out today and letting us oh, uh, learn a little bit. Thanks for coming out to visit the Flying Club. Definitely. And um, how would people find out about the Flying Club if they wanted to get interested? Uh, on our website at bakersfieldflyingclub.com. Perfect. So, Fred, again, thank you so much. My pleasure. And, Mike, we are going to send it back to you in the studio. We hope you guys have a great day. And I definitely learned a lot here. And no, let's right. play a lot into planes. Let's go cruising. Thanks for that, Fred and Mickey. And uh, careful with the one-handed flying right there. I don't <laughs> know how safe that is. Anyway, big thanks to Wyatt for coming in this afternoon, doing a lot of great work. You are now our newest ambassador, and that means you have a new uniform. You're able to wear this every day? Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> if I can get a T-shirt, there time. you go. You can wear it every day if you like to. Hey, we'll be back again. Continue to do the math. Major support for Do The Math has been provided by Chevron, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, Southern California Gas Company, California Resources Corporation, Kern Schools Federal Credit Union, Panama Buena Vista Union School District, 
Bakersfield City School District, and the San Luis Obispo County Office of Education. With additional production assistance provided by these supporters of education in Kern County and throughout the state of California. <laughs>